What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Champion Mindset, Finding the Way. I'm your host, Tommy Styles. With me, Dom Cardone. Dom, let's get right to it. What do you want to talk about today? Cool. Yeah, so I know we've been talking a bit about athletes and their mindset. Today, I want to, I know we're going to be doing a quick one today, but a lot of people don't talk about the mindset of coaches. And we did hit on a little bit of mindset of coaching, winning and losing the last episode. But I wanted to dip into making calls as a coach and the emotional aspect that could go into that. And what sparked this was uh, actually a client of mine recently. I don't know if you want, he probably won't care if it was near, but I'm not going to. He's like, he was freaking out the other night. And he was like, dude, I don't think we're going to be ready. We didn't say it in those words, but he thinks he's fat. You know, he's peeled out of his mind and way early. Um, He's just at that point where in prep, where, you know, the hormone, the estrogen's problem was nothing. Hormones are all over the place. Mind games are coming in. And I've seen it before with people. It's actually happened to him uh, before he won a very big show. And, uh, and this is somebody who doesn't really get in his own head. And um, a big aspect of coaching that's not spoken about is the emotional part of it and going into making situational calls. Um and I feel a lot of new coaches, or even not new, they let their emotions take over making a call with a client. So for instance, a lot of coaches with this may hear that from a client and they'll freak out. This client's unhappy. This client may not stick with me. This athlete you know, maybe isn't ready because he feels X, Y, and Z. And this is why it's very important to remove all emotions out of coaching. This has been something... I've done for a while, but for so this year, it is something that I really set as a goal for myself as a coach is to remove all emotions out of the equation because, you know, it's very easy for me to take what this person saying and freak out and say, okay, now we got to like bump cardio. Maybe we have to add in more T3 or clen or reduce food and push them more so they feel like they're doing more. But you have to remove that emotional component of it because the prep could go out the window just from that. I mean, this person's ready. And if I start cranking things up, I can over diet them or then have to play catch up. So, um, and even in the off season with some people's athletes, the athlete may say, I'm not growing enough. I'm not seeing this. I'm not seeing that. And then they may start adding in more gear. They may start slamming the food. And the next thing you know, this person hits a wall and you have to unfuck this whole uh, equation that was done emotionally. So being a coach, you have to really, be in tune with your emotions and know the athlete that you're dealing with. You know, number one, know what you're looking at with the athlete, the pictures, the feedback they're giving you. You have to take a step back and realize that what they're saying is probably not valid. Um, You have to really go based off what's in front of you, not off what they're thinking. Um, You know, again, you get those athletes that who talk about how they're flat all the time. Oh my God, this athlete's flat. I like, I have to fill them up. You know, right. um, and you make these calls and it does lead into poor judgment, as can being an athlete. You know, we've spoken about that. You know, your emotions take over. You start making wrong choices and wrong things start happening and it becomes a mess, more of a mess than what it should. Um, but the mindset of a coach and the emotions going into coaching has to be almost uh, very stoic in a way and very, you know, kind of just blank. What's in front of me? What am I dealing with? Where are they at? And with some guys, what you've been working with for a while is what they're thinking valid too. But that comes with experience and knowing when to trust yourself. What's your thoughts on that, Tommy? Yeah, I think the part about trusting yourself is one I've learned probably this year the most, not letting someone's emotional response in their update direct my decision-making. So That's why I like to look at pictures first alone without seeing the, seeing what they weigh, hearing whatever they're going to say in their update. That way I can make my own assessment. This is what they looked like last week. This is what they look like this week or whatever. I have a thought process going. What did I want to see? What do I want to see again? What's our timeline? How close are we? And then I'll look at this, you know, their biofeedback. What did they say they weighed? Are they complaining? Are they going crazy? Telling me they're hungry? Um, are they crying about being flat, whatever that is. So I try to make up my own, you know, this is what I want to do before I let their, um, whatever they typed out, you know, direct me down a path because I've been, you know, I've been there where it's like, 
man, I don't have a lot of clients. I need I need the money to keep coming in. They're talking about how hungry they are. Okay, let me let me meet them in the middle and maybe give them some food that I probably didn't want to give them. And now it's it's a lot less like that. It's more of, you know, I'm not going to answer to your emotions just because you're in a moment of having an emotional outbreak. This is what it is. And then if you end up leaving me because you don't like that approach, that's okay. But I think, you know, early on, I definitely probably catered a little more to people and I might be one to like give in when I didn't think it was the right move just because I was trying to keep that monthly, um, you know, income. And that's a, uh... I think an important piece that a lot of people can take home from this, if they aren't just getting into coaching, or maybe they've been coaching for a while is that money becomes that driving factor for most people. I mean, let's be honest, most people tend to get into coaching for money. It can be very lucrative, but a lot of people shouldn't be coaching, but that's another topic. But (laughs) having that compromise, trying to compromise with somebody for the sake of a dollar, sure. You may keep them for another month or two months or three months, but long term are they going to stay with you because you're comp you're trying to compromise and meet them in the middle on something that you're not doing your job at that point right they're hiring you to take the stress off them they're hiring you for that trust for you to make those calls to take that pressure off them you know you give them the plan they execute so when you're trying to meet in the middle and compromise you're doing them an injustice as far as and then you you're not doing your job as a coach and i've done this before many years ago Um, But as I said, going into this year, it was one of the most important things I had to really work on was, you know, of course, I work with a large number of people and of all different experience levels and taking out that emotional factor. Like, listen, you just made another great point is if they don't like that, then there's a door because, again, you're doing them an injustice no matter what the dollar amount is. And then even for yourself as a coach, like now, you know, if I'm just like, for instance, I, I'll share another experience story. There was a, a lifestyle client who's been working with me a year and a few months, whatever it's been. Anyways, he's changed somewhat. And this year he really, he was like, dude, like this year, really, I'm turning this age. This is my birthday. I would really love for me to hit this goal. And two weeks ago, we do his blood work. His blood work wasn't great. And I'm like, something doesn't make sense here. His body hasn't really changed over the last few months. So I put a side by side of June and and recently, and I was like, you know, what I've done with you isn't correlating with the pictures. And I've been doing this for a long time. Um, let's talk about your blood work. You know, so his kidney uh, uh, markers were a little bit elevated. I go, are you even drinking all your water? He goes, no, I'm drinking X amount of wood meals. I go, okay, that's not on your plan. Um, okay, let's talk about your diet. Are you doing, let's talk about your cardio. Are you doing your cardio? He has 40 minutes of cardio a day, one session. Oh, I've been doing it more intense in 20 minutes. Like, okay, already the red flags are there. I know the diet's not being followed. Is the diet being followed? Yes, 100%. I know it's not because, you know, even if you are doing an intense 20 minutes of cardio and I'm showing you this time frame. So this is where I was like, okay, like we are not going to go on any more steroids because I don't have the trust in you to take them. Um, and, you know, I hate doing this, but... I do have to babysit him for a little bit before I have to cut him off because he has paid up for an X amount of time. So it's like, I want to see at the end of every day, a picture of every meal you've eaten that day before you eat it. I want to see the car on your screen. So I give somebody like a lifestyle. If it's a prep client, see you later. I'm not, there's no babysitting. But this, these people need could use a little bit more love because um, maybe they don't know. And you can give them a few chances. But that's where I was like, all right, dude, this is what we're doing. This is what you're going to do. And then if they don't meet up to that, then then goodbye. But tying that back into what we said, if I compromise with this person, yeah, you know, it's okay you do that 20 minutes of cardio. Yeah, you're just eating, you're just drinking X amount with each meal versus two gallons of water I want to drink every day, but you're way off of that. You're lucky if you're getting in 60 ounces a day. Um, You know, that's where you really have to, emotions aside, this person hired you for a plan. This person hired you to meet a goal. You have to meet up to that expectation for them and for yourself. You know, if I emotionally said, okay, you know, it's okay that you did that. It would be just completely wrong. So it ties into prep clients, which it's a lot more stringent and lifestyle athletes as well, because you have to set that standard. And with that standard has to be 
very low ceiling of emotions coming from your calls. Do you have any stories that come to your mind with clients you've worked with that this has happened with or anything like that? I'm curious. Nothing's jumping out at me right now that I can think of. I just, I think I re- it took me a long time to realize that a lot of people, they cheat and they don't admit cheating. Um, like a large amount, prep clients, lifestyle. I mean, the amount of people that are just willing to to actively cheat on their plan that they're paying for and then maybe lie about it or at least fudge it. Like, well, I only cheated, but I cheated this. I, I usually double whatever they tell me. Like, you only had one piece of pizza. Like, who eats one piece of pizza? No one. <laughs> so I think it took me a while to realize that like, <clears throat> People are are really apt to be cheating on their plans. And I just kind of assume that that's the case if, if that person fits that profile. Because at the end of the day, what we do isn't rocket science. They're, the results should come, especially for lifestyle. Like if I have a guy, you know, every week, if a guy like 260, I did have a guy like this actually. He started at 260. We got down to 240 relatively easy. You know, just basically changing up food, incorporating training, some cardio, boom, 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 scale drops every week. Once we get to 240, it just stalls. And this is a large dude with a lot of body fat. And every week it's just staying. And but every update, it's like I'm following everything to a T. No, no off plan eating, nothing. And I'm just like, I started to question myself because like this, this process works you should be losing weight if you're consuming less food than the activity that you're burning like you should still be losing weight unless there's like something hormonally going on i've seen your blood work we're on trt this doesn't add up so then you know you're in that place of through an email you have to call someone out and basically because they've been saying they're on the plan 100 percent, no misses and i know that this process works so i basically accuse them in a way of like I don't think you're following the plan. So if you aren't, now is the chance to come out and tell me because this doesn't make sense. Um, Again, the person assured me they are. From there, a little bit of progress started because I completely changed the plan and and took a whole different approach, Um, you know, with like five really low days of food. And then the weekend, I fed them up, hoping that they would, you know, enjoy the weekend eating. And then again, Monday through Friday, it's really low. And there's been progress happening from that. But I can remember sitting there looking at all the pieces of this person and like we lost 20 pounds like that. And now for some reason, we're just not losing weight. And I think a lot of people just don't account for things they do based off their own emotional reactions. So you touched on that earlier, like we're talking about coaching, not letting our emotions get the best of us. But we also have to take into account what about the clients that let their emotions get the best of them? Even if it's just one time, it was like, hey, I was at the work party and I had this, this, and this. Well, that could have been 2,000 extra calories of snacks and bullshit and alcohol. And yeah, there's going to, that will throw off progress for an entire week. Um, so almost reading the updates and knowing your person and, a- and asking yourself, like, did this person have an emotional reaction? And skip cardio or you know you you learn along the way of like who your people are that are like i don't miss they check in on time they don't miss check-ins they always have the check-in completely filled out and if someone doesn't have those boxes checked then you're going to start to question like well you've missed check-ins in the past how can i be sure that you're not cheating on the plan and just telling me that you're doing everything 100 percent yeah, and that's uh, a great point as well, is that you also audit their actions in the past before like, you question yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's actually an amazing piece that you just said because you know in the moment you look at their, their update and you see their pictures and their feedback, but what has their past pattern shown? You know, are they checking in on time? Have they cheated before? And that that's, you know, I actually, again, I'm always going to relate these to experience. I have a lot of chats in my WhatsApp. I'm about to sneeze, but it's been like here for like a good minute. Um, archived. And there was somebody from last year. And the last message was from them. One of the last messages also, I guess we're not going to work together for the three months I paid. I actually sent the rest of the money back. 
I don't know how I was searching for something and I went back in chat logs and there were almost every check-in was late, you know, not on the wrong day. Um, and at the end I was questioning them um, on what they were doing. And I don't know where I'm going with this, but it just made me have a flashback. This was literally just yesterday that I've seen this. And um, every check-in was late and updates they were complaining why they weren't seeing results. Um, and people just get wrapped up in these things. So anyways, you have to realize as a coach, don't just look at what's in front of you either. Like, listen, when I work with athletes, what we're doing, I'm focused on today. Of course, I'm looking back to last week, I'm projecting to next week. But when you're dealing with athletes like that, you do have to, unfortunately, go back and track and see what have their patterns in the past shown. You know, the, the way they're talking, the way they're typing, the tone. Are they asking questions? Have they stopped? Are they saying less? Um, are they sending training updates? You know, um, the training video updates that you, you may require. So, you know, really audit what they're doing before you go ahead and make an emotional call based on what's in front of you and start questioning yourself. Because that emotion, then comes the question in yourself as a coach, the confidence in your coach and your coaching abilities because confidence is a very important thing. Like me now, I'm like, that's in my gut. I'm doing that. And that's what we're doing. And in the past that, you know, you have somebody that gets emotionally wound up, they get you emotionally wound up and you start to lose that confidence. And when you lose that confidence and you double think things, that's when things get thrown off as well as the confidence, you know, we've spoken about confidence in an athlete, but the confidence in being a coach is super, super important. And build, it takes time to build that up. Like, listen, you can, Give some, I can mentor somebody and tell them everything I do, but it's until they built up that callus to these emotional situations and have the experience of making calls and learning where that confidence comes in. Like, okay, my emotions appeal back, my confidence is there. So that's another, that's, that could be another topic that we can hit another time is having that confidence in your coaching and in your calls that overrides that emotional component of things. So if that makes any sense, I think I went off tangent a few times. My mind is like really starting to go now. Yeah, no, I, it it actually makes me so. Let's say you do have a needy client who you know can be an emotional roller coaster. How do you, as a coach, to keep your emotions in check? How do you get that person to the finish line if they're, say, four weeks out? Because I think that's the pe part of a prep where everyone becomes fragile. Even the most, you know, I'd like to think of myself as like, I'm pretty even throughout. But at four weeks, I think everybody hits that line of like, all right, they're counting one day at a time now till show day. Yeah, so that's where you have to show confidence in the athlete. Show the athlete that you're confident in what you're doing. So I've heard stories of coaches being like, all right, let's 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 make a fake scenario, right? We're three weeks out, Tommy, you're like, dude, I feel like I'm, you never do this. I feel like I'm a little behind, you know, this and that. Well, what do you think, Tommy? What do you think we should do? Do you think... How do you respond to this? How do you respond to more cardio? That for me, I would be like, wait a second. I hired you to do this for me. You know, unless you're working with somebody who's on like the top, top even then I still wouldn't do this. But there are some people that do have a good experience, 10, 15 years of competing in the pros that may have a little interjection where you guys can kind of like meet in the minds. But that's very rare. But for me to start asking, all right, Tommy, what do you think we should do? I've heard this before. Like, what? Like, what do you mean? What do I think I should? I'm hiring you for that confidence in making these calls. So when you're dealing with somebody who's with these emotional up and downs, you have to step in and be the be that leader, be that dominant coach. Like, no, dude, like, you're on point. I'm confident. This is what we're going to do. X, Y, and Z. Let's do this. You're on point. Let's keep moving forward. You're good. Those athletes should be able to click. They're going to be able to read your energy. Like that's another thing too, is that confidence and that energy in yourself, they're going to read that. How you view yourself is how the world view you, views you. How you think of yourself is how the athlete views you. And it's and I, you have to be true to yourself with that. So having that confidence in you to make those calls, they're going to read that. Um, I mean, if I was asking you those questions or I wasn't confident in myself, you would be like, I'm not really trusting this here. So then you're going to become even more emotional. You're going to reach out to other people for advice or where you know send people your check-ins what do you think this and that and start to get those other voices more chefs in the kitchen and it becomes a mess so as a coach 
having that confidence and always following your gut. And that's another thing too, is the confidence and going with your gut. Logic isn't always going to be the answer. It's going to be your gut. Like there are points where in some people's preps, like, all right, what is my gut telling me? I'm doing this. Like that's the confidence note that we're doing this. So showing them that you're confident in your abilities as a coach, that you have the confidence and, and, and belief in them, as long as it's true. You know, again, we don't want to give backhanded and you know, rub their backs and give fake compliments. Giving that, instilling that confidence in them as an athlete, showing them that confidence in them, that you're the coach making the calls, usually puts them right back into place. It takes a few sentences, confident, done, we're moving on. You know, and that's how it was with that athlete. Dude, I'm feeling this, the first one I spoke about, dude, I'm feeling we're not going to be ready. No, dude, like you're ready. This is what we're doing. He was a good, thank you. And we moved on. Yeah. So on the flip side, how do you handle someone like, I mean, you could say Ross probably, or me or Gary or someone who's like, you know, it doesn't have an issue doing everything, but they might be the person that's going to do more just because they don't want to, they don't want to not be ready. So they're going to be like, well, Dom said 50 minutes of cardio, I'll do 60. Um, this is our diet. I'm going to cut a little more carbs. I'm going to keep doing more, more, more because I just want to make sure I'm overdoing rather than underdoing. How do you handle that person knowing that that might be a tendency they have and you suspect that they might be doing it? And that's excellent because Ross did that eight days before the Cali Pro. Um, he was doing a little more cardio than he was supposed to. He loved doing steps. Um, he trained legs, some insane leg workout seven days out, and he did 30,000 steps in the same day. 30,000 steps on top of this insane leg workout. And he, remember, he checked in the next day, or was it two days later, his weight just dropped. I mean, he looked like beyond flat. I was like, dude, like, we like need to like fix this. Like, no more fucking doing this. And thankfully, I was able to pull things back and fix it. To where obviously you won the California fucking pro. But after the show, we had a talk. I was like, dude, like, you know, we're about to do the Olympia. Like, you need to, like, follow what I'm telling you. Your body is different. Every time you compete, there's always more muscles. There's always more variables. Doing more <laughs> with people like you, with people like Gary, with people like him, with people like Chris Mazzaro and um, even Cody, who turned pro this year, and everybody else. You guys are all doers, but... You need to that that conference. You have to be a bit. You have to be more assertive. Like, no, dude. Like, you're going to do this X, Y, and Z. Don't do any more. And you know, I'll use Ross. A week ago, he was on the. He was. I you posted something about doing the stair climber. I was like, how much cardio did you do? He was. I did ten minutes over. I was like, no. I was like, no. We're, uh, this is where there's no compromise. I'm like, no. You do do the cardio I tell you to do, do the steps I tell you to do, and that's it. He was like, Don't fuck you as a joke. I'm like, no, you're going to do it. And that was it. So with people like that, you have to be, no, dude, this is it. There's no like, oh, you know, it's okay. Like cut and dry. This is on your plan. This is where we're at. You have to fucking do it. That's where that a bit of like dominance and that confidence comes in. And they're like, but you guys get it. Okay, this is what he's saying to do. I'm going to do it because most people are not like you guys. It's a very rare trait that people want to do more. But when it comes into bodybuilding, coaching and prepping, you know, doing more, just like I see in Lil Ross, could have backfired and could have, you know, it would have appealed. We would have been a twig at that rate, you know? So that's where, again, confidence, supersede, like, no, dude, this is it. Pull them back, like, fucking pull them back with assertion. And that usually ends it because you guys listen. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You guys love to do more. You guys want to do more. But having that assertiveness, like, no, like, this is what we're doing. And you guys are, you guys, it goes right back in line. Right. Yeah. I had a client who we did the Arnold Amateur and I had given him a high day, like muffins, shit he hadn't had all prep. And it was just like, then he told me he worked out twice that day. And I was like, wait a minute. Why do, why did we do two workouts? He's like, well, I had the energy. I was like, yeah, but that was for a reason. So um, you get people that just want to do more because they feel it and then they act in that moment. So um, last thing, and then we can jump off here. Um, you mentioned, you know, having to assert dominance with a client like Ross that you've had for years. You have a friendship outside of it. 
you know, inevitably when you work with someone for a long time, there's probably some back and forth that goes on. That's not like just coach client. You start to get more comfortable with each other. I've got those people. Um, you know, you and I are cool outside of what we do with, you know, I hire you to coach me. How have you ever had an instance where you did let yourself get too close to someone where they then didn't respect you as a coach because you're, you're their buddy Dom. And when it came time to be coached, they became like less receptive to that role. Yeah. So it has happened before. And that's why going into this year, I was like, okay, emotions have to come out of it. Even if we have some sort of friendship outside of it. And for me, you have, and for anybody else out there that I see people talk about, this is a great client and a great friend of mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Great. But that's not going to, I guarantee you, that is not going to be great for that athlete in the long run. Um, you know, I had somebody that I was, he's a very, very good coach now. Um, he was kind of just starting, it wasn't just, he was starting to come up and um, I was like, all right, let's work together. Our friend, I didn't, I didn't have the same look. I didn't, couldn't look at him as a coach because we had too much of a friendship and it just didn't work. Um, so you have to have a hard line in the sand of knowing when to wear both hats. You know, my client, Jordan, New Zealand, he's become a great friend of mine. He fucking flew out here to Miami early this year to, um, and we like kicked it. He had no, no plans of competing, but I knew when he said, dude, I think I'm going to, he thought he was done competing. He was like, dude, I'm going to try to compete this year. I was like, all right. That's why when we started that prep, I completely removed, I was like, the friendship part of it kept in very, very little because I knew like I had to be very short with him at times. So knowing when to draw that line in the sand and wear, when to wear both hats, when you're coaching them, that friendship aspect has to go way down. You can't look at them like a friend. It just doesn't, because again, that's going to tie into making emotional calls. You want to listen to your friend. You want to be there to your friend. You want to be a good friend to your friend. But right. it doesn't work with coaching. But what's cool about that dynamic is if they do deal with something in life, you have to know, all right, let me take off this hat for a little bit. Let me put on the other hat. And that could actually help the coaching dynamic side of it, but that's going to be rare. So knowing when to draw that line in the sand, you have to take that hat off for most of the time. You have to be a coach more than a friend. And that's why with, you know, again, some people inquire, like, yeah, I'm looking to build up a relationship and be friends. And I tell them right away, I'm like, I'm not looking for any friends. I'm like, I'm looking to coach you. My job is to get you to your goal and beyond um, because I've been in that situation where I've gotten too close with the client and they weren't taking me seriously and I was becoming too emotionally invested and it just throws off the whole dynamic of coach to athlete. So guys out there, do not look to build up friendships through coaching. Some may happen organically through time and you both may have this dynamic that it works. Like there are a few with some of you guys that it just works. I know when to balance it out, but for most of the time, it will not work. I guarantee right. it will work. No emotions, get them to their goal, be fucking hard on them, tell them the truth um, and don't rub their back because that friendship will absolutely, you know, interfere things. It's happened to me with coaching and it's happened to me as an athlete. Yeah, no, I've, I've definitely been on the side of it as an athlete to where it's like, we just lose that edge, but, um, you know, I know we're coming up on time. So, uh, like share, comment, subscribe guys, let us know what you want to hear. Uh, let us know if you've been in situations where in any situation, it doesn't have to just be coaching where, you know, friendship got in the way of what the role was intended to be or, or, or a situation where you had an emotional reaction where in the future you learned that logic needed to trump emotion. So, um, quick one for you guys today. We'll be back again for Dom Cardone. I'm Tommy Styles. This is a champion mindset, finding the way, and we are out of here.